Next up is our grand panel session on empathy and CX, allowing businesses to serve their customers wherever and whenever. And our panelists are Olga Buderi, Global Head of Customer Experience at Aramex UAE. Olga has over 12 years of experience in logistics, which has equipped her with a laser focus on customer expectations, needs, and experience landscape. In 2020, she founded her own training initiative, Customer Experience by Olga, where she's on a mission to ignite the passion for customer experience in the Arab region. Welcome, Olga. Our next panelist is Achilles Monolopoulos, head of CX at Zand. I hope I pronounced it right. Achilles is a highly experienced and innovative CX and fintech professional with a successful track record of driving forward digital transformation and customer-centric programs in demanding commercial global environments. Welcome on board, Achilles. Thank you. And our panelist, the final panelist is Gulchen Boyukchel, sales director at HCL Unica, who you've already met earlier today during our summit. Welcome once again, Gulchen, to this panel. So good to have you back. And our moderator for this session is none other but our star, Ravi Raman, editorial director at Martech Vibe. Welcome back, Ravi, and over to you now. Thank you, Aziza. That's too much of pressure, but uh, <laughs> thank you so much for this for this amazing panel. First of all, I think we have two big challenges. One, we are following Colin's session, which is always challenging. And the second is, this is the last panel, so we need to really make it rock. So to offer great customer experience, you need to understand how your customers feel and make sure that's linked to their situations, feelings, and motives. Few brands actually get that. Brands really can't switch on empathy when they are addressing a customer's moment of truth. Empathy should be always switched on. So let's talk about all this and more with our amazing panel. So my first question to all of you is, CX is often seen as a client-facing function, but can it be ingrained as a company culture and how? I want to start with Olga and I want Achilles to come in and Gulchen, you can go last. Thanks for that, Ravi, and thanks for having me today. Um, I think um, you've, you've nailed it on the head that it's not only a CX, uh, a front-facing or a customer-facing function. It's something where you need to have an interdisciplinary uh, approach. You have to have a lot of uh, collaboration between the teams. Uh, and it has to be based on a very tangible strategy so that the whole organization is working towards it. So when you're talking about CX, it's not a fluffy discipline or it's not something that you're just saying we want to improve the experience, but you start approaching stakeholders with very clear uh, feedback or very clear initiatives. Uh, an example of this is, for example, we, we do a lot of analytics on the customer journey and we approach our local uh, offices or local call stations and we say this is what it looks like for the consumer, this is what it looks like for businesses, and this is what the financial and the CX impact is. So then it becomes part of their business, not something that they see as this is just customer service or this is customer experience and this is something that has nothing to do with us. Because when you give them that pain point that connects to their target or revenue, it becomes their problem too and it becomes ingrained in the company culture. Achilles, what about you? Yeah, um, uh, yeah, so also thank you for uh, for having me. This is a great opportunity, I think, to talk about uh, customer experience and we all share the same uh, passion about it. Um, I uh, echo all the points uh, raised by Olga. I, I think uh, there are a couple of uh, steps that are critical. Uh, I think Olga alluded to it. Um, I think you need to prove uh, that customer experience works. Uh, and uh, maybe it's uh, sometimes uh, easier to just take one simple use case uh, to demonstrate uh, how powerful uh, that can be. You don't, you cannot uh, change everything, uh, right, uh, straight away. So you need to um, have some steps uh, that uh, you can use in order to gather the right uh, data um, and then prove that uh, across the organization, uh, up and down. 
Um, I think once you do that, um, then you uh, need to make sure that um, you continue, as a lot of organizations have uh, set up uh, ways to listen to customer and, and gather feedback. Uh, so once you have that um, and you have the data coming in, uh, then you need to start educating people uh, around uh, ways that they can action this information. Um, and as uh, I think it's, uh, it's in the question, which is the culture, right? The culture is absolutely critical. And this uh, requires people uh, that uh, they're at the top to lead it by example. And, and also uh, to people across the organization to start questioning uh, the end-to-end -end, uh, processes themselves, uh, because that's the only, you need to be relentless uh, on that point. Otherwise, uh, you know, it, it, it's going to take a bit longer, but um, people need to question things themselves. Um, right. and, and, you know, I do agree that the culture has to flow from the top, but the accountability flows actually from the bottom. Yes. That's, that's how it works. Uh, Gulshan, I want your inputs here. Where do you see this from a technology standpoint? Yes, uh, Ravi, uh, what I've been observing for a while from the technology service provider's perspective, uh, there is a growing awareness of the importance of CX and organizations are looking for ways to connect their people uh, with their CX vision. So definitely leveraging CX culture within the organization really helps companies building a successful business. So you asked how how to leverage CX as a culture. Uh, and again, I can say that, for example, recognition of the behaviors is very important for building this culture within the company. Identifying the good behavior that drive positive, positive customer experience and link this behavior with a reward. For example, companies can recognize and appreciate their agents who always respond to customer complaints in less than <clears throat> Less than, hour, less than an hour, for example. Another way is putting a dedicated CX team in the middle of the organization, including uh, with those team members who are at the backstage and not have direct contact with the customers. So with that, I can say that if a company wants to be a customer obsessed organization, they mm -hmm. have to invest on building a CX culture within the company. Great, great point. Akhil, I want to pull you back and discuss a little bit more about what you said and talk about empathy. Now, we all understand as marketers that empathy is the most important part of CX as a strategy. But why do companies still go wrong? What, what's the missing piece? Is it the culture that's missing? Is it a keen insight? What, what, what do you think it is? So uh, uh, for me, empathy um, in the digital world, right, that uh, we're going towards. And uh, I think in a lot of uh, regions uh, already uh, with the recent events, uh, we have been taking that path already uh, quicker than uh, probably anticipated. It's uh, the ability to interact in a human uh, way. So um, the, the avoidance of building uh, processes that are dead ends uh, uh, for customers doesn't allow that empathy to come into place. Um, so I know, uh, uh, and I'm, I'm sure others uh, can share examples of uh, digital organizations or multi-channel organizations that they try to avoid the human interaction. I think customers are expecting to be treated uh, according to uh, their needs, personal needs, right, and preferences. So, um, and also they're expecting when they interact in a human way that um, the organization will know them. Um, and they, because we have the data and we should be treating them based on what we know and what we're expecting them to uh, request uh, from us. Um, so I think we need to uh, listen to, to the customers, uh, show the empathy that uh, is required uh, and, you know, we're, all, we're not going to get it right every time, uh, but you need to interact, engage, and, and in a human way, you know, um, I think that's what they're expected. And that uh, we discussed, right? It requires the culture to be right. Uh, you need the right people, that they have that kind of skill set, that they can show the empathy to the customer. And that takes time uh, to embed into an organization. 
and you need the information. Uh, I but the, agree. And, and one key factor which we've discussed earlier too is that technology cannot be used as a cost saving measure. It right. has to be more of a service measure. Olga, what are your thoughts? Because I think Aramex has done a very you know, successful implementation of technology, which has a human face to it. I've myself used your bot and I found it to be very intuitive and very, very customer friendly. So tell us a little bit more about how did you go about implementing that? I think that's, that's a great question. And uh, I want to echo Achilles here in terms of, um, you want to be very specific when you're looking at CX. So you obviously you cannot improve everything at once. So you want to know your priorities and where you're, you know, uh, the design is lacking the most empathy or there is the, the biggest need for the organization to focus. And this is what we've done when we've developed our bots. We were very focused, very zoomed in. Uh, we knew that this is the future for capturing customer feedback. This is the place where customers would like to interact. It's very easy, it's intuitive. Uh, who doesn't have WhatsApp on their mobile, right? And uh, it's, it's one of those apps that are very prevalent. At the same time, uh, I want to differentiate between empathy in uh, design and then empathy at the point of the touch point. Because this, these are very different things. I think often organizations do a very good job of empathy in design. So understanding as a one-off, understanding their user, empathizing, who are they, where they exist, what's their environment, what are their thoughts, fears, gains, pains, you know, and they have that conversation and they collaborate. But then how do they consume data? How do they build it within the processes? How do they keep on reiterating? This is very easy to come up with uh, a certain step and then you explore and say, this step is based because operations is easier this way or because this will speed up our operation cycle. But then you have to interview users, you have to really understand what's their point of view. And we've done a lot of those user interviews. And sometimes, you know, the feedback was, uh, how can you expect me to answer this question? I don't know mm. as a user. So you didn't give me enough information. It's not sure. about that users don't want to use it. It's not about the design is not right. It's not about that we've, we're doing an internal, you know, uh, process focused, but because we are assuming that the user will know the answer. So sometimes it's really digging deeper and then consuming this information consistently at the point of interaction. This is what makes design uh, good. What will make it great is listening to those conversations over and over because things are changing in the world that we're living in. Uh, Saudis introducing a national address or you've got this new way that consumers are communicating with each other or WhatsApp has changed the feature. I'm talking about a specific project, but then this applies across uh, the board. So True. it's an environment that's changing. There is uh, another vendor that's using a new app that people become accustomed to. So understanding not only how they use your tool, but also how you use the data available. And this is, I think, one of the obstacles that organizations face, especially if you're a large organization, you have a, a massive amount of data. So how do you make this data consumable? How do you ensure that the systems are consuming this data at the right point? In fact, in fact one of the questions that we have from the audience talks about how a virtual customer service is being used more and more and whether you see that trend you know, going forward and does it really increase customer experience. But we'll come to that. I also want to touch upon something very important, which is uh, voice of the customer. So now feedback obviously is critical, but do you see somewhere the voice of the customer is getting lost in the data deluge that we have? And what should brands do? Uh, Gulshan, I want you to start and then Achilles can come in and Olga can take it mm -hmm. forward. Sure, uh, Ravi, I think your question itself very well defined the challenge, right? The experience is getting lost in a ton of data. So I would like to share a statistic uh, at that case, uh, which is uh, around two thirds of the world population is now connected to the Internet. And in the more major markets, over 70 percent of customers start a search online or purchase online. And this continues to grow exponentially. So uh, in order not to lose the voice of customers and provide a seamless experience, the, the brands should understand their customers. And uh, for, for that, by I mean, uh, they have to harness the data and they have to turn into actionable insights. They have to zoom in and zoom out to the root cause of the customer struggle. 
because if if organizations don't understand the root cause correctly they keep investing time and their money to solve a problem which is a wrong problem right so in short i can say that understanding their customers by analyzing the data they leave behind their journeys is a must to build a strong cx strategy okay Liz, what about you what are your thoughts on this yeah i look i fully agree i think the, this is the the main uh, points that uh, I think the people are raising, which is the actionable uh, data, uh, the culture, uh, the education of the people involved, and to make sure that you improve your processes. But the uh, voice of the customer happens uh, every day, every moment. Uh, once you have managed to build that culture, you don't wait for the data to come in. You don't wait for the weekly uh, voice of the customer uh, committed to take uh, place. If people are empowered, they'll take action. And that is the point. Voice of the customer, you need to action on the spot. And that links to the data and the KPIs that you measure, like first contact resolution, for example. But it's what people do with that information. So um, I think we've discussed this uh, before. Right? Uh, the, the organizations that they have, uh, uh, as, as mentioned before, that they reward people when they do the right thing. And doing the right thing for the customer uh, it requires empowerment. Um, you don't need to have data. And that brings the empathy, right? If you listen to the customer, you empathize with the situation, right? And you're empowered, you do the right thing. You need to think as a customer. And to the previous question, I think Olga raised this, um, you, uh, the, the way the processes are designed are not necessarily for the happy paths. We design for edge case uh, situations, right? And what we do and to be ready for those scenarios because out of the box solutions, they will give you wide label uh, processes. What you need to think the what if scenario and build for that. Then the, the person that is interacting with the customer has the tool, the technology, and the empowerment to do the right thing. Interesting. Olga. I think uh, echoing uh, Colchin and Achilles, definitely voice of customer is not something like a checkbox item that you have to do just because you want to report to management that you're doing voice of customer. It's not something that you do for just for benchmarks or measurement. Um, it's something very adaptive and it's also echoed in the voice of employee, in the voice of the front line, because these are the people that are using your tools, they're encountering customers on a daily basis, so they have this uh, data in their heads and sometimes it's difficult to, to extract that and collate it to the process. Uh, so we have to be very cognizant how we, uh, what Coach described, close the inner loop and how we do root cause analysis on the outer loop. So how do you make, um, how do you operationalize uh, experience? How do you operationalize voice of customer? So at the point where you captured feedback around your service center or your contact center or uh, any touch point where you had a bad experience with a customer, what do you do next? How do you fix it? And this, this becomes this is how you get the organization involved. And it has to have some kind of uh, technology governing it so that you can go back and you can analyze, you can understand how many times those incidents are occurring, what is the reason, and so on and so forth. And it's not a one-off thing. Uh, so I think the challenge might be people or organizations spending a lot of time just looking at scores, comparing, rather than what to do with it, or what are the real uh, uh, scenarios or issues. As Achilles mentioned, sometimes we're focusing on the happy case scenario. We need to be focusing on what could go wrong? How can we fix it? Um, one of the things that we started doing differently this year was instead of uh, giving customers checkboxes in our voice of customer exercises, uh, we stopped doing that. We, we said, tell us what the issue is. It's, it's a hassle and it's a lot to analyze and it is exhausting and it's manual work. But then you're not limiting them to what you think you know about them. You're giving uh, customers the opportunity to voice out concerns or scenarios especially with the world we live in where we have new personas joining our uh, tech landscape or using the tools, uh, issues that we don't know are happening. 
just because maybe you were telling you choose your problem is it a loss shipment or a damage shipment or a partial delivery maybe i don't know maybe it's something about the courier uniform that ticked you off i want to know this and i want to categorize it and have that thematic uh, understanding so that we can Olga, Olga, i want to just hold on to that thought about what you said about the voice of the employee and i want to discuss that further but before that Kuchin, i want you to bring in bring you in to talk about one point that olga mentioned which is about it's exhausting and it's manual so where does technology come in to really empower brands employees to really give a better empathetic service uh, yeah, uh, Ravi, we, we have, I mean, Olga and Archie has already covered that customer engagements uh, should or must leverage the insights to, en uh, to engage across all channels. But other than that, uh, I would like to highlight that pers personalization must be done. So this can be happened over time as organizations unify their channels and data uh, and getting to their customers with relevant products or relevant com communications uh, means customizing or specializing uh, their experience instead of shooting them lots of transactional or marketing messages means they are, I mean, if, if the company can do it, it means they are being uh, empathetic. So if we think about the technology platform point of view, uh, what it takes to personalize an engagement and build a seamless experience, it means to understand past behavior, current behavior, predictive behavior, and engage with relevant content in the moment of interaction. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is the challenge that CX leaders face, how to deliver one-to-one -one communication in real time through any channel the customer engages with the brands. And more than that, how to make this communication always on. So technology comes in to, to uh, overcome these challenges. All right. I want to go back to the voice of the employee now. So, uh, Achilles, where do you see the voice of the employee coming in? And if you can give me a very practical example, not in your yeah. current company, but your previous company, where it's really made an impact? No, both companies, uh, it's fine because uh, I'm using the same approach, right? Uh, so... Um, uh, Fortunately, uh, both uh, previous company uh, and this one uh, building things from scratch. Um, so I have uh, two parts. It's uh, that I call how does it feel for the customer and how does it feel for the uh, employee? Um, so the two need to align. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's true, uh, the happy employees uh, will ensure that uh, <laughs> this is uh, transferred to the customer and they, they, they take care of the customer. Um, but it's the tools that you provide, right? The, so the ease of using a CRM uh, tool, for example, uh, with a single sign-on, one application to handle all customer queries. And that's what I've, I've done uh, three times now that... Uh, for um, multi-channel interactions, uh, you know, one queue, uh, you can handle all chat, um, voice, uh, social, uh, and also have the, the customer details right in front of you. So you don't have to go through verification. So uh, people appreciate this because they have the opportunity to spend more time, right, uh, into connecting with a customer and building a relationship but rather than having to say tell me what you're calling me for let me authenticate you all of these things have been taken away right and the customer can come through straight to the agent and they can have a human uh, conversation on the issue that we already know about i don't need to ask you again you know, if a transaction failed, I know about it. So let's just get on to the issue, <laughs> right? Rather than having you to repeat again. Sure. And it's the same thing, I think, similar to what Olga is describing uh, with uh, WhatsApp. Uh, the type of uh, chat uh, that uh, we've implemented, it's a synchronous chat. So the history remains, you know, that uh, use case uh, that... Um, somebody is uh, in a banking app uh, messaging uh, through the uh, secure chat uh, session and then they go out of range and they lose the connectivity and then they have to come back in and retype the same stuff again because uh, so that we've taken away right so 
the, your history remains, you receive a response, and then you can pick up the conversation whenever you know you you want. Uh, so those kind of tools are important to uh, the employee because uh, they feel that they have the right tools, the right information to to address uh, any customer uh, question. Olga, apart from the technology tools, uh, one very specific example of how the voice of the employee has made a positive impact in your organization. I think uh, one, one of the greatest examples is because we, we act as a central hub or as a, uh, not exactly as an HQ, so we have a lot of democracy in the way that our teams operate, uh, but we act as uh, an internal consultancy, uh, if you will, uh, for the rest of the organization. So there is always uh, feedback that's coming through our help center. There's always our uh, team who's uh, likely to provide feedback uh, evaluate different ideas, and these are ideas that come from our front line, from customer service uh, leaders, managers, saying, why don't we do this? Or we've noticed that this, this process is very exhausting, or and so on and so forth. Um, so it's always taken into account, and we have a great accountability towards the organization in terms of, uh, I've even had some of our teams abroad who keep, uh, what do they lovingly call a BCR list, so a bug or change request list, for us, so they have this huge list and they will say, this is what we would like to change. And it's a very democratic process where we engage consistently together and say, look guys, this is what we want to do. And usually when we do it, because it's not a one size fits all, we will try in one location, in the pilot location, and then uh, from learnings and findings come up. And uh, it's sort of like you're, you're pitching this solution to every new leader or country manager and saying, this is what we are planning to do. What are your thoughts? Would this work? And there is always that, you know, uh, we have this person or this champion. And sometimes it's not even someone who's officially designated. It could be someone from the station. Just today I had one of those discussions who uh, someone was saying, why don't we just have, like, for example, a global passport? Wherever I travel, I can use Aramix. And it's those ideas that we scope and we start road mapping together. Uh, so this is one a great example where voice of uh, employee is always in our lives. Great. So you have lot yeah, please. Okay. So, sorry, so just uh, one point on this, uh, because I've been in an organization that uh, we had this process. And um, the, the, the one thing uh, we managed to do is um, in order to create that empowerment is to allow people, for example, let's call it call center agents, um, not just to submit the idea, but uh, also uh, take the time out of the shift um, to sit down with people that they manage that process to explain the requirement, document the requirement, submit it through the change management process and see it through to implementation and reward the person for implementing that idea. Um, and that um, created the, that kind of culture that people were really taking ownership and, and you know, to see it through. And also they became your business analysts of the future, right? They gave them a path uh, to understand how they can grow within the organization. And some of them really became, you know, superstars after that. Wow, that's, that's, that's a fascinating uh, case study. So now we have about three minutes. And since we are at the end of the year, I want to get into predictions for 2022. So uh, each of you can give us one prediction in terms of CX and empathy. And how do you see what's going to be the next big trend or a big direction that companies would take in 2022? Gulshan, I want to start with you. Then Olga Atkins. Okay. Okay. Let let me let me summarize uh, quickly the key trends. Uh, so one, understanding the customers. Uh, two, leveraging the relevant content, not only for a single communication but also throughout their entire journey. And three, learning from any, every interaction and behavior and continuously improve the journey. I think these are the key uh, steps for building an emotional connection. Uh, with, with our end users. Interesting. Olga, what about you? One key trend. I think um, it's definitely going to be around uh, creating more profiles or creating more use of data, but it's, it will be more specific rather than 
for example, profiling customers for the sake of profiling. So it will be very specific around why do we need this and what is the job to be done. Uh, and as the data becomes easier to process and easier to crunch, it will be consumed in real time and much easier for uh, you know, different systems across the organization to use it. Achilles? I think we, um, we're the in the path from uh, being uh, reactive to being proactive. And eventually over the next uh, couple of years, I think hopefully will be predictive. Uh, that will take time. But I think for the time being is using the data to personalize the, the experience. Um, I do not uh, personally, I do not believe in personas uh, or in segments. I think every customer should be treated uh, you know, uh, individually. And personalization, uh, I think for me, is, is key. Great. Predictive CX was one, going to be one of my points, but that's <laughs> on the discussion. I think that's a wrap. Thank you so much for this amazing session. Aziza, over to you. Thank you so much, Ravi, Olga, Gulten, and Achilles for sharing so much value in one discussion.